systems research is running out of time. Measuring time is the foundation of systems research. Most systems papers have evaluations which involve time. Many of our experiments consist of making a change to a system and evaluating how the timing of various operations are affected. Often, we compare the runtime of these systems against other systems. Even though time is central to our evaluations in systems research, we usually don't think too much to check whether our ability to measure time is correct. If our time measurement instruments are inaccurate, that could lead to misleading evaluations, especially when we compare across systems. Now, this runs in contrast to other more mature scientific fields where reproducibility is important. In these fields, they start with instruments that are calibrated and known to be functioning correctly and tested regularly. Calibrating these instruments reduces the potential for measurement error and is the foundation for good science. So given that measuring time is so critical, you might be asking, why don't we simply calibrate our clocks? And is this actually a problem in practice? In this talk, I hope to convince you that it's not that easy and that it's actually resulted in real experimental problems where results have been retracted. So calibrating clocks in computer systems isn't so simple because measuring time in computer systems is actually quite complex. To understand this, let's first understand how time is derived in a computer system at a high level. Usually applications like a benchmark makes calls into a timing API to read the time of a counter in hardware, which represents real time. Now that counter gets incremented by a clock crystal at regular intervals known as the clock frequency. At this point, you might say, aha, all that error must be coming from the clock crystal, so let's calibrate that and be over it. It's true, the clock crystal ticks based on the laws of physics, and the frequency it ticks as at is affected by things such as temperature. However, the error that we get in the clock over normal temperature ranges is quoted on crystal data sheets, and it's something like 20 ppm, or 0.002%, which isn't enough to cause serious issues with benchmarks. To see where the real issues are, let's map this to a real x86 Linux system. So in x86 Linux, time starts at a special clock known as the RTC, or real-time clock, and that runs even when the system is off. When Linux boots up, it reads from the RTC counter to get the time, but it turns out the RTC is too slow to read from frequently. So the Linux just uses the RTC to update another counter called a timestamp counter, or TSC, which is clocked by the CPU's clock and located on the CPU core. A benchmark actually sees the clock, usually uses the clock get time API to get the time. And if you ask for clock monotonic, Linux will usually pass the current time from the TSC. However, most systems run a user space time daemon like NTP, which synchronizes that clock to remote atomic clocks. So to get the true uncorrected time, you might want to use clock monotonic raw, or maybe you want these time adjustments. On some machines, the TSC stops or slows down when the CPU goes to sleep or idles, so we can't use the TSC. If Linux detects that the uh, TSC is unreliable, it will use another counter instead, such as the HPET or ACPI counters that exist on the processor chipset. These counters have varying latencies to access and tick at different rates. On some processors, accessing the HPET can be many times more expensive than accessing the TSC. In a virtualized environment, a hypervisor might intercept those calls or a newer machine supporting the TSC offset feature uh, direct them to hardware. It's important to note that being able to use the TSC requires knowing what the clock frequency of the TSC is, which isn't always a CPU clock. This frequency is sometimes difficult to know if the virtualization is involved, but if you get it wrong, you get the wrong time. There's a lot of other nuances I haven't gone over, like the VDSO mechanism, but hopefully that's enough for you to get an idea of how a benchmarking tool gets time on a Linux system. Um, so it's actually pretty hard for Linux, to, uh, for the benchmark to know how it's getting time. The Linux kernel actually has some interfaces to query what the time source is, but as far as we know, no benchmark really uses it. Now, this is problematic because different time sources have different access latencies, and Linux can change the clock at any time based on what it thinks is the correct clock. Uh, we have evidence from recent kernels that and processors that even today, the clock that gets selected isn't consistent. So here's the basic problem statement. Applications today generally don't know or care what clock they're getting the time from, even if the act could have an effect on timing. While this is okay for systems in isolation, it's a real issue that if we have to compare against other systems. Now we presented the x86 Linux uh, clock system, but how about other systems out there that have their own unique 
clock systems such as ARM, M1, Windows, Graviton. How do we compare against those systems? Now, you might be saying, well, the time system sounds really complex, but eh, it seems like it'd be really easy for me to detect if things are off. Well, actually, it's not. I'll show you some real examples where timing errors actually cause real issues with experimental measurements. Perhaps the most famous result was a non-tech retracting their benchmarks for the AMD Ryzen 2. Now, non-tech is a pretty well-respected website that benchmarks new processors. In 2018, they published results for the AMD Ryzen 2 that blew Intel Skylake X out of the water. Now, actually, what happened was that the HPET in the Skylake X was actually much more expensive to query than before, resulting in the, Sky, in the Skylake performing poorly on the benchmark, even though the actual performance was better. The conclusion in non-tech reach was troubling, however. It was incredibly difficult for them to notice that there was an issue, and if the results were closer, no one might have noticed the discrepancy at all. Uh, after all, it's just numbers. So the non-tech issue is an example of timers going up in cost, but uh, incorrect calculation of the timer frequency is another sort of error. Uh, it turns out that LLVM's X-ray profiling tool doesn't calculate the TSC clock frequency during turbo correctly, and that results in function times that don't add up to the wall clock time and can't in a virtualized environment since the timer simply isn't exposed. Google figured out how to get this value from their kernel and built their own kernel module, but uh, didn't share it. So this person had to build their own module to expose the frequency, which still isn't available in mainline Linux. Perhaps even worse is that for several versions of the Linux kernel, Skylake X workstations had an incorrect TST frequency calculated, resulting in the clock jumping two minutes an hour, or 4%. Now, most people didn't notice because the NTP would uh, correct for the time, but uh, between NTP synchronizations, the clock would be way faster than expected. Now, this wasn't a short-lived bug either. It was present in several versions of Linux for over a year. Overclocking was another recent source of timing error. In this case, a bug in the way the kernel calculated the TSC clock, yet again, only showed up in overclock systems. This resulted in a 2% change for this user, which notes that the motherboard supports increasing the frequency by up to 6%. Now, like the previous bug, this one persisted in the kernel for several TS versions and even resulted in people getting confused they weren't seeing any performance gains after they overclocked their machines, as you can see in this uh, super micro um, website. It turns out that the fix for the bug was just to stop using the frequency reported by the processor itself and for Linux to measure the frequency using another known clock. Uh, now, this is problematic if the um, hardware reported frequency is the most accurate one that we have. So overall, this is an issue. I mean, we shouldn't be relying on manually looking at our data for inconsistencies to know that our clocks are wrong. If there are a few inconsistencies, it might be really hard to realize there's a problem in the first place. And simple kernel bugs uh, incorrectly calculating the TSC uh, will definitely show up again, and especially with all the SOCs that are showing up. So we need a more principled approach. We need to calibrate our clocks, and that involves, as you see, uh, calibrating the entire stack. So we think that for each experiment, we should take the time to under measure both the error of the clock and the cost to call it. Now we can actually use existing systems like NTP for this, but instead of using NTP for error correction, we need to use it for error detection and report the error to the user instead of correcting the clock. Now, if you wanna be really precise, um, we've actually been able to do this with a cheap $10 GPS clock to calibrate, but to detect all the errors that we just discussed, uh, NTP is just fine and probably all you get in the cloud anyway. Now, when we compare results across systems, we need to compare these calibrations and make sure that we can compare uh, results. And this is gonna be critical as we start getting more and more architectures. So there's lots and lots of future work. Uh, we plan on releasing a tool soon to help ca users calibrate their clocks before running experiments. Um, there's a lot of work in both the hardware and software layers to improve timekeeping. Um, and we think that accurate timing requirements need to move from the hardware into the software. There's no reason why the specifications of clocks should be so ambiguous in the first place. Um, we need ways to minimize the effect of measuring time on our experiments. And finally, we need to 
um, make sure that we can improve the confidence of timing because it's critical for systems research. Otherwise, it'll only be a matter of time before we run into another timing issue. All right, uh, thanks for your time.